today um, we are continuing in this series, and we're really basically talking about how to discover God's will. Is that even a thing? Can we figure that out? Can we know really? Because especially as Christians, if you've been around church world for, for any, any amount of time, if you've been a Christian for a while, then, then you've had this question at some point. How do I know what God really wants me to do? Can I really know what God wants me to do? Can I know what his will is for my life? And, and of course, we, we felt like absolutely we can know that really based on um, the biblical narrative that we have. And so we said last week, though, that to know God's will, you have to first understand the nature of God's will. And so we said last week that really throughout Scripture, it's presented in kind of three different ways, three different sides to God's will, so to speak. And first there is God's sovereign will, which is what God is going to do no matter what, whether we like it or not. He is going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. Then there's God's moral will. So that's kind of one side, God's sovereign will. The other side, you've got God's moral will, and it's the, the commands and the, the, the teachings and the things that we know, the things that are clear in Scripture as to how we should live our lives that have been made clear. And then there's God's personal will. And so we said that, that in order to really decipher and to figure out what God's personal will is, it's oftentimes it's going to be found somewhere right in between God's sovereign will and God's moral will. That in order to understand and to really know and to learn and to discover what God's will is for our lives, then we need to be more and more familiar with what God's going to do anyway, with what God has already communicated and told us to do as far as how we live, and then it, will, it just will become easier and easier to know what God wants us to do. And so today, um, I want to address a question that I briefly mentioned last week, and it's, and it's really this, like, how do we know what God's will is when we don't have a lot of time? You know, when there's not a lot of time, because let's just face it, there's the day-to-day -day stuff, there's the decisions, you know, who we're going to marry, where are we going to go, am I going to buy this, am I going to invest in this, am I going to start this business, am I going to move schools, am I going to change jobs, you know, what is it that I need to do when I need to know right now? This is the basic question. How can we know when we need to know now? When we got to know right now, there's a deadline, there's a timeline, there's just something that is kind of pushing us and it's a decision and it's not necessarily a right or wrong decision or a good or bad decision. It's like there's, there's options and, and there's multiple things that could be, but what do I do? How do I know God's will when I don't have a lot of time to dig into the scriptures and to know what God's ultimate will is and to figure out how God's moral will applies in this situation? When we don't have time for that, kind of what's the fast track, so to speak? to discover God's personal will in any given situation. And there is a way to know this. There, and we're going to talk about a principle. We're going to actually, if you have your Bible or you want to flip there on your phone, however you get there, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 12 today, way back in the Old Testament. It's actually, I counted, it's the 11th book in the Old Testament. So if you go all the way to the left and then start making your way to the right, you'll get there. 1 Kings chapter 12. Um, but in here, tucked in here, is, is a principle that I want us to see that is so simple and so obvious, okay? I'm just going to say that up front. It's simple and obvious. Um, so much so that it feels like, you know, well, why in the world are we even talking about this? Do we really need to talk about this? And yet, um, we all have such a hard time actually applying this principle, which is often the case. The simpler things are, it seems like the more difficult they are to actually, you know, gravitate towards. And so, um, this is so important. I'm telling you, if God, God uses this so often in order to speak to us, maybe um, it's more even perhaps the most prevalent way that God speaks to us in order to reveal his personal will for our lives. Um, and so I want to figure out what that is. And that's what we're going to look at, but then we're going to kind of break it down and, and give some very practical things today. But let me give some context to the story. So this is just kind of a, a, a snippet of a story that happens in 1 Kings. And this is way back. It's 3,000 years ago. Okay, This is a long time ago. Um, there were, the very first king of Israel was King Saul, as you may know. Saul um, didn't do a great job. Um, he ended up getting replaced uh, by King David. And David did a really good job as king of Israel. But then um, his son Solomon became king. And at first, things were going well. I mean, this was... You know, three kings in to Israel's, you know, being a, a, a kingdom like this. 
and they were doing very well, but, but then things didn't end so well for Solomon. Solomon got off track, and it was really because he turned away from his relationship with God, and he became enamored with his foreign wives and their gods. He began to worship them, and so God spoke to Solomon, as you can imagine. He spoke to Solomon and said, Solomon, I'm, I'm disappointed in you. You have turned away from me, and you have worshiped other gods, and so here's what I'm going to do. I've already made the decision. This is my ultimate will. This is my sovereign will for what's going to happen, and I'm going to tear the kingdom away from you. But because of my, a promise that I made to your father, David, I'm going to leave, I'm just going to split it in two, and half of that kingdom is going to remain under his name, and then half is going to be torn away completely, and that's what's going to happen. So that was what was prophesied to Solomon. At the same time, there was a man named Jeroboam who received a prophecy from a, an, an individual, a prophet, who spoke to him and told him about the same thing, but that Jeroboam, this guy, was going to be made king of one of these um, halves of Israel's kingdom. His name was Jeroboam, and God promised Jeroboam that he was going to be king over um, one of these kingdoms, one of these split, you know, when, when it split. Solomon eventually found out that this prophecy had been made to this man named Jeroboam. Of course, he didn't like that. It's like, no, 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 that ain't happening on my watch. And so he sends people to try to eliminate. He goes and he tries to chase down Jeroboam. Jeroboam flees to Egypt and escapes. Of course, it felt like it had resolved itself. Because then there was... Who, who everybody really in Israel thought, no, nobody knew about this prophecy. I mean, very few people did. Most people assumed what you and I would assume, that a, an heir of Solomon's would become the next king of Israel. And so everybody really thought, most of Israel agreed that Rehoboam, Solomon's son, would be the rightful heir to the throne, that he would be the next king of Israel. And so they sent an assembly of leaders to, fi to, to find Rehoboam because Solomon had died and they were going to install him as king. Matter of fact, many people already were just calling him king, King Rehoboam. And the story even references that. Even though they're going there in order to say, we're going to make you king or we're going to make it official is really what was happening. And so they sent this assembly, but, but then there is, there's a moment in the story, and this is where we're going to pick up the story. There's a moment in the story where, where a request is made by the people to Rehoboam. It's like, we want to make you king, but there's just something we want to ask of you first. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. This is um, chapter 12 of 1 Kings. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone there to make him king. Everybody agreed. He's the one. He's going to be our king. You know, they didn't know anything about Jeroboam necessarily, and so that, that's what's going to happen. Okay? Well, in the meantime, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of this, because after all, he was in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon and he returned. And so Jeroboam hears, Solomon's passed away and he hears that everybody's about to install Rehoboam, Solomon's son, as king. So they sent for Jeroboam. So this assembly of people, they sent for, so Jeroboam was apparently a prominent leader of some sort. And so they sent for Jeroboam and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, so you kind of get the picture here, the scene is set. This assembly has joined up with Jeroboam, and they've gone to see Rehoboam, Solomon's son, in order to make him king, but they have a request to make, and this is where we get kind of the, the good and the bad decision here, sort of a wise and unwise uh, path that Rehoboam takes. Listen to what happens. Your father put a heavy yoke on us. So here's the request that the people are making of Rehoboam. We want to make you king, but here's what we're asking. Your father, Solomon, put a heavy yoke on us. But now, we're, here's what we're asking. Lighten the load, lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we'll serve you. Would you do that? You, you, you know what a hard man your father was, and you know how hard he was and the, the pressure that he put on the people. And I'm telling you, the way that he taxed us and the heavy and harsh labor, it just about destroyed the people of Israel. Literally just, I mean, this was Solomon's reign. And the people were, were you know, just at a point of breaking. And so once Solomon passed and his, you know, son was going to be the, the heir to the throne, they just wanted to know, would you do us this favor? Would you consider not treating us so harshly. And we promise we will serve you. 
we will serve you well. And this is where he makes a, one really good decision, and he asks for time. And so Rehoboam answered, well, here's what I want you to do. Go away for three days and then come back to me. And so the people went away. He, go, go away. Give me some space. Give me just a minute. I need to think about this. I mean, you've, you ever fi- found yourself and you just need to ask for time? I just need a little time. But three days isn't a lot. He's literally going to kind of set his policy and the way that he's going to rule based on his answer here because they've made this very... Uh, intentional and very serious request. We want you to treat us differently. We want to have a a different kind of relationship with you, Rehoboam. And so would you do that? Well, then um, during this, this process, Rehoboam makes another really good decision. Then King Rehoboam, he actually got referred to that way because that's the way people were, had already kind of crowned him in their mind. He did a really smart thing. He consulted the elders the people who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime, the people who have been there, the people who have seen it, they've watched how Solomon led the people. They've watched how, what a, what a a slave driver he was just about the way that he overtaxed the people and put so much pressure, this burden, this yoke on these, on, on the people so much so that it had brought them to misery. And, and, they had seen that, they had experienced it, they had, they had been through it. And so, smartly, Rehoboam goes to them and says, how would you advise me to answer these people? I want to know, what's your, what are your thoughts? And of course, they give him their thoughts. They replied, well, if today, and watch this, so important. Key word here is serve, okay? If you want to circle a word in your Bible, this would be one of those you would circle. If today you will be a servant... Now, this is different. This is different than your father, but I just recognize this is what they're looking for. If today you will be a servant to these people, the people of Israel, and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. In other words, they're saying, Rehoboam, if you will do what your father didn't do and position yourself as a servant leader with the people of Israel, Serve them. I promise you one thing. They, they will serve you all of your days. They will be a faithful people. That's our advice. That's what we think you should do. But then he, he got unsmart. You know what I'm saying? Like he, got, he, he did something not so smart. He did, this was a good idea, but then he didn't really like the answer. Apparently, it's not what he was looking for. Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him. Nah, that's not what I was looking for. And instead, he consulted the young men who had grown up with him, my buddies, my posse down the street, my gang, my peeps. Like, those are the people who I want to know. Like, these are the guys who are actually going to be serving with me long term because they're younger. And so, like, I, th- these are the guys I want to know because I think they're going to give me the answer I'm looking for. And they were serving him already. And so he says to them, what's your advice, guys? Hey, hey guys, what do you all think I should do? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? What do you think I should do? What do you think? What are your thoughts? Got any ideas? I kind of know what I think you're going to say, but why don't you go ahead and tell me? And sure enough, he asked them that. Well, the young men who had grown up with him, they replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter? They said this to you? Here's what you need to say. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. It's like, what? What does that mean? Figurative language, right? Just means if you think my father was bad, you haven't seen anything yet. It's about to get really bad. That's what you need to tell them, Rehoboam. You need to make things real bad. And then they continued, tell them this. My father laid on on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I'm going to scourge you with scorpions. You thought he was a tough leader. I'm going to be tougher. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be bigger. I'm going to be badder. It's going to be more about me than it was about, even, even than, it, than it was about him I'm telling you that's what's going to happen. Not the best decision. And, and, and yet in this moment, he, he's faced with this, which way should I go? What, what kind of decision should I make? And, and he, does the right thing at first, but apparently it's, his intentions were wrong, and he didn't really, he kind of knew what they were going to say, but he didn't, but you know, it's like, let me just go kind of 
do lip service to these guys. He didn't really want to hear it. And instead, he goes to these other guys who tell him kind of what he wanted to hear. And sure enough, like that sounded, I mean, because in our world, it's like, are you kidding me? How easy? Just be nice. Be nice. Be a nice king. That's reasonable. You're still king. Just be nice. But in his world, it was a real decision. There was a dilemma here. It was like, on the one hand, I could could do kind of what they want, what they're asking, you know, because after all, if I don't and it continues to be harsh, they may turn on me. So that that could be difficult. Not sure I want to do that. At the same time, if I give into their request, they may just start keep, you know, coming back to me over and over again, asking me for more and more. I can't be kind of a weak king. He had a dilemma. And he goes and asks these guys, but it wasn't exactly what he wanted to hear. So he asked somebody else and he, and he took the time and he did the right thing at first, but then it was clear his intentions weren't good. And so here's what happened. So then three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, come back to me in three days. I mean, come on back and then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. The king answered the people harshly and rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. And then watch this. So uh, this is amazing. So the king did, this is the commentary on what just happened. So the king did not listen to the people for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word The Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Naboth, through this prophet, Ahijah the Shilonite. From the Lord, in other words, there was a, there was God's sovereign or ultimate will in play here. And that's what this commentary is telling us. And that ultimately, so there's there's a couple of things really. First, that, that God's ultimate will is oftentimes fulfilled through the personal will or the free choice will of those pe- people like you and me. That, that oftentimes, that, that what God wants to do ultimately is somehow, and this is the mesmerizing part, it's hard to figure out, there's something God is going to do, he prophesied about it, this is what I'm going to accomplish, but I'm going to accomplish that through the free will decision of this person or this group of people. And Rehoboam just played into his hands. God knew what he was going to do. And so just right off the bat, I I would suggest that you and I, knowing about God's sovereign ultimate will, that he's going to do what God's going to do anyway, that that part is there. And we would do well, we would do well to know it, to understand it, and to actually cooperate with it to the best of our ability. So that's number one. But number two, it's what well, the, the, there's a principle that's talked about here, but it kind of gets glossed over. It's kind of tucked away because we see it as being so simple that we just don't pay a lot of attention to it. But it's just the fact that we need to go to other people sometimes in order to hear what God wants to do in our lives. And he did that. He just had the wrong intentions about the way he went about it. And oftentimes it's not what we wanted to hear. Or, you know, maybe they gave us the advice that, that we knew we were going to hear, but we didn't really like it. And, and here's the thing. I, you know, I, I've been in ministry for 20 years. And um, so I've, I've talked to a lot of people and I've heard a lot of stories over the years. And, and oftentimes when I'm talking to somebody about what's going on in their lives and the way that, you know, the direction of things. And oftentimes when, when people sit down with me, it's usually after the fact. You know, it's not like... I've just got this decision to make and I just need to know what to do. More often than not, it's because they've already gotten uh, themselves into a mess. You know, they're, they're, they're experiencing some problems. You know, they've gotten themselves at the end. You know, it's like, I don't know what to do because I've done this. And I'm telling you, and, and you know, I try, I, I'm not being ugly, okay, when I ask this, but often I'm, I'm always, I, I want to know, did you talk to somebody first before you made that decision? Like, did you actually talk to somebody? Like, did you ask, did you go to somebody and ask them? Like somebody who you trust, somebody who you trust that's going to tell you the truth and they really do care about you. Did you talk to somebody and ask, like, 
before you got married or before you moved in together or before you bought your third boat and your fifth car, like before you moved from the trailer into a 4,500 square foot home, did you talk to somebody before you took out yet another loan? Did you, did you talk to somebody first? And that's the part I say, okay? The part I don't say is, is because it just seems like to me that anybody, had you actually talked to somebody, anybody with like half a brain and like the lowest IQ possible could have figured this one out. <laughs> like they would have known better. Hey, that's what I'm thinking. And I don't say, you know, I'm so much more pastoral than that, but <laughs> that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, this was like really obvious. How did you miss this? With some people who I really have a relationship with, long-term relationship with, who I know they know I love them, like, I'll be a little more blunt. You know, it's like, okay, how did you not know? Why didn't you ask somebody on the front side? But here's the thing. You laugh, but it's like even Christians do this. We just say it differently. You know what we say? Well, no, I didn't talk to anybody, but I prayed about it. It's like, well, I know, and I'm not, you know, not making fun of that. I mean, prayer needs to be a part of this, clearly. Prayer is a part of it, but God's done more than that for us. He has offered us more than that. God has offered you and me more than just, well, let me, let me pray about it, let me think about it, and let me try to figure this out on my own. But here's, here's the reason why this is so important today. The, the idea of going to somebody for wisdom and for counsel and to other people, getting other people involved. Here why, here's why this is so important. Because oftentimes in many decisions, the, the decision-making environment that we're in, there's often too much emotion. Think about this, especially if you're, Young, young people, or if you're, if you're in any kind of relationship, this is especially true. Because when you're in a relationship with somebody and there's, there's tension, there, there's always emotion involved. And what does emotion do? Emotions cloud things, makes things you know, difficult. It's hard to figure out. It's hard to be objective when there's emotion involved. It's just true. It's hard to remain objective and to, and to see things clearly. It's why other people can often see things a little bit better than we can and speak into our lives because, and you've done this with other people. It's like, how can you not see this? Like, this is a terrible thing. Do not do this. And they're like, oh, but I just, we just love each other. And it's just, gonna... if you've been in love before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like it can be a foggy mess to figure out and discern what the smart thing is to do. But there's also times, um, maybe even just within family members. I mean, it doesn't have to be a love relationship. Just anything you're too close to. Any situation or circumstance that you're so close to that there is a lot of emotion involved, we need other people to be able to speak into our lives, to speak objectively. But then sometimes the situations, there's just, they're too complex, you know, like it's a little bit over our heads, you know, maybe there's an area of finances or business kinds of decisions that are like, you know, I know something about that, but I don't really know all about that. And you don't even know what, you, what it is you need to know. And you just know you don't have all the information and you don't have time to figure it all out and to go to school so that you can make the right decision. You just need somebody to be able to speak into that. In either of these cases, this is, these are the reasons it's so important that we need somebody to be able to speak into our lives and that God chooses to use people in that way. This isn't just about, well, that's just a smart thing to do. This is actually, this is a wisdom thing to do. This is often what God wants to use in our lives as long as we're sensitive to the fact that God wants to do so. You won't pay attention to it. If it's just, you're, going to be, you're going to pull a Rehoboam and you're just going to kind of do your thing, you know, and go to where it, it just, you know, looks the best and feels the best and, and go with that, if anything. But the truth is, God has given us so much more. He has given us, and this is just basic. God has given us each other. He has given me to you, and he's given you to me. He's given us the counsel of other believers. He's given us wisdom in numbers. And we need other people involved in our lives to do that. But, but pause. Do you know why you're not going to do this? <laughs> because I, I, I'm just, I can just tell you, Christian or not, you know, old, young, whatever it is, educated, uneducated, you know, 150 IQ, 50 IQ, wherever you are in the spectrum, the reasons you don't do this or won't do this 
Number one, pride. Isn't that true? And let me just, let me just rag on the guys for a second. Um, isn't it true that it's pride that really is getting in the way when we're lost and we don't want to ask for directions? And I know GPS has helped guys a lot. Praise Jesus. You know, it's like, I don't know what I mean. I got GPS. That's what it said to do. I don't have to, I don't have to stop. There's just something about it. It's like, especially, you know, Leroy, we've talked about it. If, if there's a time on the GPS that it gives him, Leroy wants to beat that time. If it says you're going to arrive in 7.2 hours, Leroy wants to get there in 7.1. And I'm not stopping to ask questions. I'm not stopping to pee. Like, we just got to go, baby. Right? And guys are just, we're terrible. Let, let me just tell you something. And this is to all of us. That's not leadership. When it comes to leading your family, leading your kids, leading a business, leading a church, you know what leadership? Leadership isn't making the decision on your own. Leadership is owning the decision once it's made. That's leadership. It's not making the decision on your own. It's owning the decision once it's made. Don't let this get in the way. We need other people to speak into our lives. But you know another reason? This is just like all of us at some point in our lives. You know the reason that we don't want to do this and involve other people, allow other people to speak into our lives? Because you know what you're going to hear. You already know, and you don't want to hear it. I already know what they're going to say, and so I don't need to go ask them. That's what you're thinking. And kids, man, I'm telling you, like, they are the best at this. Like, they don't want to come. It's why your kids pit a a one parent over the other in any specific situations. Like, I know what mom's going to say, so this time I'm going to go ask dad. But then when it's something else, it's like, I know what dad's going to say, so I think I'm going to go ask mom. I mean, all the time. They know how to play those cards. When you know what somebody's going to say, and it is not what you want to hear, that's not who you go to. This is what Rehoboam did. Rehoboam knew what they were going to say, and it was like he just, it was clear he was doing lip service to say, yeah, well, what do y'all want me to do? I know what you're going to say. Yep, that's not what we're going to do, though. Let me go ask these guys. You know, so I went to them. You told me to go to them, so I went to them. Don't say I didn't. It's like, no, 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 you're, you're missing. You clearly don't really want to know what God wants you to do. You see, <coughs> if we really cared... And I assume that some of you actually do. I assume that we do, that we really do. I, I want to know. I mean, don't you feel that way sometimes? Haven't you had this thought? I want to know what God wants me to do. How do I know? How do I know? If you're serious about that, then maybe we'll do something that, that has to defeat our pride and has to be okay with what we feel like we know we're going to hear. And we're just sensitive to the fact that God wants to use other people to speak into our lives, to reveal himself to us. Because here's the truth. I know that God uses this all the time. I've experienced it myself. Did you know that that's why we launched Ridge Church through an organization like ARC? I don't know if you are familiar with that. It's called Association of Related Churches. They are a church planting organization. They have had a lot of experience. They've planted almost 1,000 churches now in the last 20 years unbelievable. And it's crazy, the community that's been built and the systems and the way that they just, they, they just kind of know what to do. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. Go with this. And we could have very easily, when we were talking about launching this church, it would have been very easy to just go, let, I mean, let's just do this thing, you know, like, let's just go and get started and we'll set up some chairs and, you know, we don't have to talk about it. People hear about it, like, it'll be fine and we'll do you know, some potlucks, and man, people will come. I mean, we could have done that, but I didn't want to do that. I, I my mind, okay, um, I am always very sensitive to the fact that God wants to use other people to speak into me, and, and th- here's the way we say it in our culture. The way we say it is, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Well, guess what? I didn't either. There's been a lot of churches that have been planted that have been successful and have done very well, and I didn't want to have to reinvent it. I just wanted to go to the people who already knew. Like, that sounded smart to me, and so I just went to them. Y'all advise me, y'all coach me, y'all tell me what to do, and that's what we did. But the same is true for our lives. And when it comes to making these decisions, when it comes to figuring things out, it's like there's not a right, there's not necessarily a wrong or a good or a bad. I just need to know what I need to do. 
what do you think I should do? I need to go to somebody. I need to, but here's the thing. I also recognize that some of you are thinking, but I've done that. I've been there, I've done that, and I've gotten some terrible advice. Anybody? Raise your hand if you've gotten really crummy advice from people over the years. You've gotten bad advice. You, I used to go to counseling, like, and my counselor didn't know what they were talking about. In my past, I went to pastors, and they didn't know what they were talking about. You ever done that? It's just like they, they t- gave me terrible advice. They gave my kids terrible advice. They gave my wife or my husband. They gave them terrible advice. Like that. We all have, I mean, let's just go ahead and confess. We've all had stories like that. I get that. That's not the point. The issue is... The issue isn't should, should we or should we not involve other people in our decision making. That's not the question. It's, the question isn't does God or does God not use other people to reveal himself to us. That's not the question. He does and he will and, and it is good and he does use them and we do get good advice sometimes. So that's not the point. The issue is are we approaching it the right way? It's not, do we need to? I'm just telling you, that's, that's a biblical principle. That's the principle of life. You tell your kids to do that. We'll see what they're doing. Involve them. Go ask your teacher. Get some good advice. We do that all the time. We, as parents, want to advise our kids that way, don't we? We want our kids to come to us and to ask us and to you know, learn from us and don't, don't do this or avoid this. And we think it all the time. We, we understand this principle until it's something we aren't real sure we want to do. So we know this is something, but, but there's, there's a couple of things that we've got to do in order to get this right, okay? First of all, and this is just going to be real practical. First of all, you just, you've got to choose the right people, okay? This isn't just anybody. This, this isn't Rehoboam. It's not just, let me just pick some people off the shelf. It's like, I need to pick the right people. There is a right people when it comes to this. A right person, a right people. But let me, let me be clearer when it comes to this. Choosing the right people means choose someone who has nothing to gain or to lose by telling you the truth. Write that down. You should, you should write that down. <laughs> choose someone or a group of someones who has nothing to gain or to lose. You see, the problem with what Rehoboam did is he went to guys that had a lot at stake. They had a lot to gain or a lot to lose because as things went with Rehoboam, because they were so closely serving with him, they knew that it would reflect on them as well. It would impact them. And the way that the decision that Rehoboam decided to make was going to impact them in a really good way or a really bad way. And they just wanted to make sure, let's just give you the advice that we think will set us up for success. Don't go... you and I both know there's, there's almost no value speaking to people who have something to gain or to lose by telling you the truth. You want to go to people who don't, like people who care more about you than they do their relationship with you. They care more about the friend than they do the friendship, right? And then choose people who are already where you want to be in life or in some area of life. It's, your finances or if it's a job or maybe a marriage maybe maybe they've got a marriage that you just covet you want a marriage like their marriage guess what people like that often have a road map they've got some thoughts and you know what they're going to tell you well it wasn't always this easy but here's what we did man you want people involved in your life like that if if there's if there's people who are already doing well and handling their money well. It's like, how do you do that? What are you doing exactly? Those are the people you want to go to. There's somebody who's, who makes good decisions and, and loves their job or their career. What is it that got you there? How do you, I want that. I want to make sure that I'm doing that one day, that I feel that way. Okay, those are the people you want to talk to because they may have a roadmap for you that points you in the right direction to give you some steps to take. They may have some insight, some wisdom to be able to speak into your life. But we so often don't want to do that. We avoid it because we feel like we know what they're going to say and it's going to be too hard and it's too difficult. But I'm just telling you, if you're serious about wanting to know what God wants for you, I want to know his personal will for my life. What do I do in this situation? You want to know the fast track? Go talk to some people. 
involve some people who have nothing to gain or lose by telling you the truth and speaking into your life and choose people who are where you want to be in whatever, whatever area that is for you. And if you find yourself, let me just say this, if you find yourself avoiding going to certain people who you feel like are going to, you know, they're going to say this, I know what they're going to say. But let me just tell you, you want to know what a red flag looks like? If you find yourself having those kind of thoughts and you're avoiding going and speaking to people who you know love you and have your best interest in mind and you're just avoiding it because you don't want, that should be a massive red flag. If you know what your pastor is going to say about this or you know what they're going to say about that, then that should be a red flag. If you're finding yourself, if you're entertaining those thoughts, red flag, pause. Don't allow that to go any further. If you're really wanting to know what God really wants you to do. Then, a couple more. Choose more than one person. There, there is wisdom in numbers. It's not just about, let me just go find that one person. Oh, sweet, I like what you said. Let me just go with that. Go, you know, go find a second opinion. You know, that's what you do with doctors. Do this about decisions that are going to change the direction of your life. And then choose someone you know and someone you don't. This is just these, again, those are just like idea thoughts. Choose people you know, choose some, somebody you don't know. And then put those things together. But then, but then, when you sit down with somebody, face to face, you know, a, a pastor or a friend or a small group or a small group leader or an elder or somebody who's farther along in years or a couple that, you know, is kind of where you want to be. When you sit down with them, you've got to also know what it is you're going to ask. You've got to go in praying for God to reveal to you some clarity. God, would you just give me clarity here? Would you, would you speak to me? And, and, and it doesn't have to be weird, okay? You don't have to call that person up and say, hey, by the way, I'm expecting in our meeting tomorrow for God to speak to me clearly. So be on your toes. You know, it's like, don't be creepy. Like... Just personally say, just, I, I want to hear from them, but really, God, I want to hear from you. Would you speak to me? Would you give me clarity about what to do in this situation, in this decision that I need to make? And then when you get there, there may be a hundred other questions, but make sure these are three of them. As far as you know, this is what you're going to ask. As far as you know, are, are any of the options I'm considering inconsistent with God's word? As far as you know, it's like, I know you haven't been to seminary and you may not have, you know, studied the ins and outs of scripture and you know every, I'm not suggesting that, but just as far as you know, is there anything that just kind of raises a red flag for you? Is there anything that bothers you? I have people come do this all the time. I mean, this, you know, is, is this okay? Like, can I do this? Can I move in that direction? Is that all right? Is there anything as far as that, because that may help. There may be one over the other that just kind of, and that kind of ends it for you. It's like, I don't need to go that direction because that just pushes the envelope with what I know God's word teaches me. I need to go this way. Maybe something as simple as that. But then ask them, what do you think the wise thing is to do? And here's why I said it this way, because it's not about, well, is this a good thing? You know, is there anything wrong with this? How, I mean... If you find yourself asking that question, here's the first thing I say to somebody who says that. I'm like, you're asking the wrong question. Because I can't sit here and tell you, should you take that job or should you not take that job? One is wrong, one's not. I can't tell you that. It's not even a good or bad thing. It's really just, is it wise? based on who you are, based on who you want to be, based on the direction that you want to go, based on what I know your future hopes and dreams are, I can tell you what maybe is the wise thing to do or what maybe is not wise. Because th something can be a good decision and not be a wise decision. Do you think this is wise? And then finally, what would you do if you were me? That's so simple, isn't it? But man, if we, if we and, and not like Rehoboam, like, would you tell me so that I can not listen to you? <laughs> so that I can say, no, I don't think so. I really want to know. 
Are there any red flags here? Is this wise? What do you think? Is there something I need to know? Is there something I'm not thinking about? Is there something I'm not considering? What would you do if you were me? And did you know that, that if I operated as your pastor at Ridge Church without a group of people who provided this for me, you wouldn't stay here very long. I mean, you expect me to have people around me who are going to be honest about what is right, what's not, to be weighing, is this a good decision, is it not? Should we be taking a loan? Should we not? Should we get into a building now? Should we not? This is why we're eight years in almost and we're not in a permanent facility yet. It's because I've just leaned hard into a group of people in this church who I trust, who are willing to help guide these kinds of decisions. And you expect that of me. Guess what? We all need that. Why do you think that, that, that that's a better way for me to operate as your pastor if it's not a better way to operate as a father or a mother or a husband or a wife or a boss or an employee, a student, a teacher, whatever it is? These are good questions to consider. And I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, God will... If you're sensitive to it, God will begin to use people to speak to you. And no, it's not like flashing lights, you know, and it's blue light special, and this is what I'm telling you because you spoke to them. Come on. That's not, this isn't the, the ooey gooey, oh, it felt so amazing, and like I've got this strange piece, and like that's, that's sometimes, that's a part of this, but I'm just telling you, it's oftentimes way simpler than that to figure out. Did you ask somebody? Did you talk to somebody? Don't just go running off and do something. Do the hard work. Be willing to, to allow God to reveal this to you in a unique way. And he will. He will. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, here's what I'm asking. Is that you would give us the wisdom to know what to do because this is so practical, so simple, so obvious. I mean, what are we talking about here? Go have a conversation with somebody and you're going to reveal your will. It seems so obvious. And yet we're so bad at this sometimes when it's not what we want to hear. And yet, God, would you give us not just the wisdom to know what to do, because we know what to do, but the courage to do it. And we trust that you will reveal yourself to us and your will for us in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. If you'd keep your heads bowed for just a second. I just want to talk to those maybe at home, watching online, maybe even in the room. Let me just ask you, let me just ask you this. Um, could it be that God has been speaking to you through other people in some area of your life and you've just not been listening or you've chosen not to listen? Could it be? Okay, question one. And then question two, could it be that God has been speaking to you individually and you've just been pushing back? And yet you know, you know what you need to do. And it's just a surrender. It's letting go of the reins and allowing him to lead. If that's you, I just want to allow you to confess that, just to say it, to pray this. You can say something like this, Heavenly Father, I, I am sorry. I've been trying to do it on my own. I know this gets me into trouble. There are people who love me, who care about me, who want to tell me the truth, and I've just not been listening. I confess that to you right now. I confess that I'm a sinner and I know I need a Savior. And I believe his name is Jesus. Would you guide me? Direct me. I give you control. I give you the reins. I give you my life. And I thank you for it. Thank you for the cross. I pray it in Jesus' name.